is the role of open source changing with technologies like the Internet of Things and ubiquitous connectivity and everything today coming with a software layer? I think that's the most important question, actually. And um, where I'm coming from is that uh, I'm passionate about free and open source software because I have a defibrillator in my body that I rely on. And um, my, my heart is literally connected to a device with software that I can't see. Mm. And uh, in researching why that's so, you know, in researching how unsafe these medical devices are, I, I, I started asking some of these questions um, because as we have all these medical advances, these devices are broadcasting wirelessly. They're talking to a lot of other things. Um, you can uh, potentially monitor if you've got a, you know, an insulin pump. You can monitor your um, your blood sugar levels on your phone and compare it to your diet and um, and track your, your diet and your exercise regime. Um, and as we move towards an Internet of Things, everything's talking to everything else. And with, for example, um, cars. So it's a very short walk from medical devices to cars because you know the average luxury car has 100 million lines of code in it. And uh, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, one bug is introduced. So that's a lot of bugs. Even if we cast the, catch the vast majority of them, there's still going to be bugs. Software has bugs. I think we, we, we software experts all agree. Every, every software engineer knows. And, um, and so in an internet of things, everything is talking to everything else, which means that we're only as safe as our weakest link. So when, um, when uh, academics show how um, unsafe cars or medical devices are, so cars for example, they don't go straight for the brake system. They don't go straight for the critical systems. What they do is they go to the systems that talk to the critical systems. So they'll go through the entertainment system. Mm. Or for example, they'll go through the wheel maintenance system. So cars are sometimes broadcasting you know, to the dealers, my tires are low in air. And so that's broadcasting remotely. Um, it's not considered a particularly critical system. But because everything talks to everything else, you can get into critical systems via less critical um, uh, applications. And so what, um, what, what we have is where, where we have an Internet of Things where your light bulbs are talking to your computer, maybe it's your security system, maybe your refrigerator. We're only as safe as our weakest link in there. Mm -hmm. So which means that our software is becoming, all of our, our software that has seemed not so critical is becoming critical as it interacts with everything else. And so free and open source software has never been more important because we will never have true safety and security over time without free and open source software. Right, right. And you brought up the, the open software for medical devices and, and the healthcare industry is particularly challenging for a myriad of reasons, but regulations is one of those. How, how does that play in? I mean, it's so interesting. Um, you know, I think I, when I first started this work, I was a little naive. I was, I sort of thought, I'll just call the FDA up and explain to them that this is a problem, <laughs> and they'll fix it. And actually, I had some really lovely conversations with people at the FDA who were very well-meaning and very smart, and um, who recognized that these were problems and how, you know, and, and to think about ways to, to deal with them. But it's been a very slow process, and there are a lot of interests involved, and it's very hard to move um, to move the FDA. So I'm more focused on advocating to doctors, for example, who are the true consumers of these devices, right? I'm a cyborg because I have a defibrillator, but um, but I didn't really choose my company that I purchased it from, the doctors did. And so the it's been a very slow moving process with the regulatory regime, and I think through this slow process, the FDA and other governmental agencies have recognized that there's a problem. But they don't really know what exactly to do about it, and they have been publishing um, you know, proposed guidelines and taking comments. And I think all of that is moving quite well, but at the same time, we have all of these contradicting um, agencies and areas of law. So um, we just participated, we Conservancy, um, participated in a, the DMCA uh, triennial review process. We asked for an exemption for smart TVs, and also I participated um, in, a, in a group of medical researchers that asked for an exemption from the DMCA. Because under the DMCA, if you, um, if you use anti-circumvention, if you circumvent um, technological protection measure, measures to get, um, to get information off of your, your device or to do research or to trust its safety, it's a potentially a criminal offense. So uh, you know what was, what's interesting in that whole process is that the um, the exemption was granted with a, a one-year delay, which is really fantastic. Um, where the copyright, the Library of Congress, is uh, recognizing that um, that research is very important and that it should be done with safety um, for researchers. But at the same time, the idea that the copyright, uh, like the, the copyright regime, would have anything to do with the FDA 
and with medical device security is bizarre. Mm -hmm. And so we have all these intertwined laws and we're coming out sort of at the other end where I think everyone recognizes that there's a need for security, but nobody has yet connected the dots uh, officially, as I can see, um, from the agencies about how free and open source software over time will be more secure. Right. And study, studies show this, there's a, um, a honeymoon effect where, uh, where it, it, if, if you look at vulnerabilities in software over time as opposed to bugs, so the number of bugs decreases over time. If you look at the number of bugs in software, as you'd expect as a software project matures, the number of bugs decline. But if you look at uh, vulnerabilities, actually it, it turns out that initially there's like a zero, um, you know, the line is, is flat at zero of exploits or vulnerabilities. Um, at the beginning, and then once there's one found, it increases almost exponentially, and it's a it, and it's it's true across proprietary software and free and open source software. So what that tells me is that it's not necessarily today that you need to worry about your security bug. It's down the road. It's when your vendor may no longer be in business if you've you know if you've sourced some of your software, and how will you ever fix a problem if you don't have access to your complete and corresponding source code and the scripts to install it? You, we will never be able to do it, which means that that the ideas behind copy left are actually fundamentally like fundamentally important for security. And I think that we're we're going to see, as, as, unfortunately, as we see more exploits and as we see more vulnerabilities, we'll start to learn this. But unfortunately, the issues are very complex. So I can't say to you, free software is better and full stop. And if you use free software, there won't be any exploits. It's not, it's not like that. Software is vulnerable. Um, it's just that over time, we'll only have safety with free and open source software. If there's a problem, we'll only be able to fix it um, you know, with free and open source software. We won't be dependent on a single vendor. So these issues are fundamental, not just to, um, you know, it's not just like a cool collaborative environment, but it's a really fundamental societal issue. And we, we, we need to build infrastructure that's ethical and safe. And we can only do that with free and open source software. Right. And what do you see are the steps to achieving that, to, to making that that progressional transition um, to, to allow that sort of thing to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the main thing is education. Um, and I think that the next step of this has to be companies getting on board, big companies that use free and open source software that are um, that are comfortable with free and open source software to sort of talk about their successes and um, and talk about the safety that's with free and open source software. We've had a lot of um, FUD around the risks around free and open source software, all of the legal issues, all of the, you know, but in fact, I think we can um, we can show uh, for over the last 30 years that free and open source software has been much safer um, in, in a myriad of ways. So I think that that's one thing. The second thing is individual education, that software freedom, free and open source software has seemed like a bit of an esoteric issue. For people who are not technical, they're sort of like, what, it, it either goes over their head or they say, oh, I'm not, you know, I use my tablet, I use my computer, but I don't, I have my phone, um, but I, I don't think too deeply about it. And what I think we need to do is we need to shift as a society to thinking about these issues as fundamental to who we are and what we do. Our software controls the way we interact with each other, every, all of our critical systems, and if we don't start being invested as a, as a, as a, as a, voting public and as a discoursing public, then we're, 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 we're never going to get there. So I think that the, the issues are, are, I really think that the next steps need to be a lot of public discourse and conversations like this. And, and, and I really would like to see a little bit more, and this is where I'm turning it around a little bit, a little bit more investment from, from media professionals in free and open source software because the issues are so complex that I wish I could go out there and say, you know, uh, free and open source software, better, do it. Um, but the issues are so complex that I, I, I can't, with any kind of academic integrity, gloss over the complex discussion around it. And so I'm struggling to find a way to simply bring that message. And I can talk about how critical software is, and I think we can sort of get there. Um, but we need to take that next step of, of, of drawing the lines of over time free and open source software is better. And it has to happen both from the corporations in our space and from individuals and you know, from a sort of like a public grassroots movement. Right, and kind of related to that, you've you've got a talk where you um, note the importance of negotiating your employment. Mm -hmm. And so, from an employee perspective, when you're looking at contracts and how those particular arrangements might affect the software that you're developing, what are some of the key considerations and questions that that you should ask? It's really fascinating. Um, the 
the free and open source software space is so interesting because a lot of people jump from employer to employer working on the same project. Like we're in a funny situation where I know people who have had like five jobs in the last two years, but they've been working on exactly the same thing. Um, and so there's a lot of movement in our field and a lot of companies that are invested in free and open source software. And yet when each employee negotiates their contracts with their um, with their employers, they, they take it fresh every time and they often just take the agreement that's handed to them thinking that they're supposed to just sign it. Um, but it turns out that actually agreements are negotiable and people don't realize that. You can ask. You can actually ask your employer for things to be altered in your agreement and sometimes they will say yes. Never will you have so much power as the moment before you sign your agreement. Once you're an employee, once you're on the payroll, you lose that, that power diminishes and uh, you know it becomes very difficult to get things changed. But when they've chosen you to be their next employee and they've gone through the interview process, they're set on you as their hire, it, it never hurts to ask. Um, and so, uh, and also sometimes helps to say, a lawyer suggested that I ask for these things and then it's not me, it's this lawyer, but can we, <laughs> and it'll clarify the things that you think are fundamental to your employment arrangement, so, uh, a relationship. So for example, a lot of people employed in this space are being hired to work on free and open source software, but their employment agreement is silent about this. Um, but they uh, understand from their interview process that the work that they do will be released under a free and open source li software license. Whether or not proprietary versions will be made by the company down the road is something else and it depends on the company, but many people believe that the work that they're doing will always be available under a free and open source software license. And unfortunately, while many employers believe that when they make the hire, down the road sometimes things change. And it's best to lock that down, especially if there's an agreement in the interview process that you'll be working on free and open source software. Um, getting that in the agreement is, um, is, is very useful. Um, making it clear that the things you work on outside of your employment are your own is another critical thing to ask for. And often these agreements, and we could talk about their enforceability. I really don't want to bore everybody with this like, super legal talk. But one of the things that I'm doing at Conservancy is I'm working on um, some standard contract language that people can pick up so that you can say, um, you know, and they, it'll be modular because some things, you know, you might want, um, won't necessarily work together, but you could say like, I want clause one, three, and four, and here's language already so you don't have to scratch your head over how to say it. You know, things like, what is my scope of employment? Or, you know, things that I worked on before I, you know, anything I worked on before my employment with you with this free software project is my own and will continue to be, you know, things like that, it's, it's super helpful and, um, and getting that locked down from the beginning is critical. Well, so last question for you. Okay. What people or projects are you following? What are you finding personally interesting oh. these days? Well, this is one of those funny things where because it was my medical situation that caused me to be so passionate about free and open source software is that my personal and my professional are so deeply intertwined. I think that's true of a lot of people in this space. Um, so uh, I really dig all the things that Conservancy, my organization, are doing. And, but we have like almost 40 projects in Conservancy, Git, Samba, Wine, and we have so many. And so I follow all of them, and they do really cool stuff. One of our projects that I'm particularly interested in following is Outreachy, which is a diversity program for women and uh, other underrepresented groups. We just expanded the program to include um, people of color that are underrepresented in US tech. Um, like a lot of companies in the last year published their stats, the last year and a half. Um, and in this, the stats, they have like the very bottom portion of uh, what people, you know, the minority groups that are, are not represented. Um, and so we basically expanded our program from women and, uh, you know, and, 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 and other uh, gender related groups to, um, to that very bottom segment in tech groups. So, um, uh, and, that's been very exciting, and so uh, in doing so, we expanded the program to include um, uh, as coordinators uh, Cindy Polaris and Tony Sebro, um, and and we're working to include other people too. And I'm I'm so excited to hear those voices. You know, like as our program expands, it's going to be run by the people who we've been reaching out to, and um, and so those are the voices that I want to amplify and and hear. So I'm I'm you know that that's sort of what I'm I'm, I'm digging. I wish I had something more fun like a uh, a cool cartoon that I want to <laughs> reviewing, but uh, but I, I spend my Saturday nights reading case law sometimes. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you very much for talking with me today. That's been fun. Thanks for having me.